All right, what's up guys? This is Alex from Xtrades. Back to you with another weekly trade ideas list. Hope everybody had a wonderful trading week last week. Enjoyed your weekend, all that good stuff. This week, we actually have a pretty quiet week in terms of data. Last week, we had the CPI and the PPI, so two inflation reports made the markets a little volatile. It argues it's kind of choppy too. But either way, we finally got some of the big data out of the way, and we could be heading into kind of like a quiet period in terms of data. So Tuesday, August 15th, this is arguably the most important data we have on the week. It's going to be the U.S. retail sales. It's always a hit or miss with retail sales if it's going to impact the market or not. It just depends on how extreme the reading is. And you can see we have retail sales minus autos. We also have import price index. We also have the Empire State Manufacturing Survey, business inventories, and then Kashkari Fed is also speaking. Fed speakers are a hit or miss. It just depends on how hawkish or dovish they sound. Usually people are just looking for Jerome Powell and they pay attention to him the most. But sometimes you'll see market move to other Fed speakers as well. It just depends. So Wednesday will arguably be the most important and it's not because of the data sets. The data sets are actually pretty quiet. It's nothing really crazy, but we do have the FOMC minutes. So we'll be looking for language that was different than what they gave us during the last FOMC meeting. I would say this could definitely move the market maybe anywhere from half a percent to 1% in either direction. That's usually what the implied move is. If you look at the options, it just depends. But you know, anything from the Fed always has a potential to impact the market so that people pay attention. And usually algorithms and other traders are just looking for a language difference or anything they might have missed. And they look for that in black and white instead of hearing it from the Fed's mouth like we get during the press conference during the FOMC meeting. So they'll just be pretty much browsing through this looking for something different. It could, you know, have something new. It could not. It could just be the same thing they repeated during the press conference. It's usually what happens, but sometimes you kind of do get a little hint of some different language and the market will interpret it how they want to interpret it. So this will be the most important day and it's not because of the data. Retail sales is going to be the most important data, but this will be the most important event of the week and that'll be the FOMC minutes. And then Thursday, just your regular initial jobless claims. Market has actually been reacting to this a little bit. Everybody's looking for an uptick. They want to see you know that the Fed's tightening is working and they want to see the labor market change up a little bit because honestly the jobs market has not been reacting to interest rates at all. The jobs market has been fine so people are looking for that uptick in unemployment or any hint that unemployment will tick up. That way they know the Fed is doing their job and it's working. And then also we have the Philadelphia Fed manufacturing survey. This can move the market a little bit. I've seen it move it you know, once or twice, but it, like I said, it just depends on how extreme the reading is. And then Friday, nothing. So very quiet week in terms of data, but we do have the FOMC minutes. Like I said, this can move the market anywhere from half a percent, maybe to 1%. That's what I've seen, you know, pretty commonly, but it just depends. You know, I don't really know the exact, but just kind of giving you a ballpark. So that was economic data. Now we'll go ahead and get into a quick seasonality chart before we get into our individual tickers and the index analysis that we go over every week. Kind of just want to switch it up, do something a little bit different because we kind of do the same thing every week. We go over the economic calendar and then we go straight into charts. So this week, since Season X was kind enough to finally add the S&P 500 to the free users, because I just use a free a free account on Season X. Sometimes I check it out and sometimes I take away the S&P on here because they want you to buy a subscription. And I don't really look at seasonality too much, but I do check in from time to time to see if they re-added this just because September and August do get kind of choppy. Historically, they do have some pretty big moves especially in September. People go on vacation, liquidity goes down, and markets can get a little stagnant and get a little choppy, but also get a little volatile too, just because it takes less bids and offers to move the market. So when there's lighter volume, you kind of feel like the market whipsawing a little bit more, and that can increase volatility. So you can see on Season X here, this is a free account. We do have the 25 years of data. This is all the way from August 11th, 1998 to August 11th in 2023. So it's 25 years worth of data. You can see that it actually has a small uptick here. If you look really closely, probably up to August 18th. And there's just a little dip and then chop. And then towards the end of the month in August is when it starts to sell off a little bit. Likely due to the end of the month rebalancing. Large money managers, they're probably rebalancing their portfolios that can 
result in some selling or some sale imbalances to the downside. So I have mentioned actually this is August 11th. We actually have August 14th to the 31st. So this is our data that we selected. So this goes till the end of the month. I accidentally made a mistake there when I said that. So this is this half of the month down to the end half of the month. And you can see actually it does have a negative 0.62% return. So just a little over half a percent in terms of historical data. So the last 25 years, this does average a 0.62% move down from August 14th to the 31st. And you can see that towards, it's towards the end of the month that it starts to get a little bit reckless and the markets will start selling. And if you look over here, it's not highlighted, but that September is when it starts to get you know pretty crazy. So I just wanted to show you that we do have a little uptick coming up potentially in terms of seasonality. It doesn't have to pan out. Obviously, this is just taken into account, you know, 25 years worth of data. And in those 25 years, there's going to be some weeks where August 14th till the end of the week, you know, probably did have some downside as well. It didn't just go up every single time, but it does take into account. And it looks like you do have a little uptick coming up here. So I just want to show you that. And then it does go into chop. So that's for the S&P 500 historical data. And now we'll go ahead and get into our setups. So our first one here, we have eBay. You can see it closed up 2.8%. Great relative strength in terms of the market. You know, SPX closing down, you know, just a tenth of percent, nothing crazy. And then the NASDAQ is actually getting slammed on Friday. It was, it was down over 1% at one point. Came up just a little bit, but still closed down 0.64%. So tech was the weakest and there was some relative weakness in terms of tech. So eBay closed really strong. It also reclaimed our trend line here, you got a test one, you got a test two, you got a test three, it bounced off test three, right at its earnings, broke under just briefly, but it held this big demand zone. And you can see it actually bounced from this demand zone right here. And it also keeps trying to hold it up right here. And now finally, with this big bullish bar, we did reclaim over the trend line and we reacted to the demand zone. So I think this looks pretty bullish short term. Obviously, I can't really see past, you know, maybe 46s or so. Because that's where you start to get up into a resistance point right there. We rejected off it over here, over here. And we also do have a little gap here from earnings. So this could eventually fill. Most of the time, gaps do fill. It just takes some time. So you do kind of need to be patient if you're going to trade a gap. Because it's not just going to fill it right away. But most of the time, they do refill either up or down, depending if it gapped up or if it gapped down. There's a pretty high percentage that it will. So that's just some extra analysis. Obviously, it's a little bit further away from what we're looking at right now. We're at 44.50. The gap's all the way up in the 46s. So it's not a gap fill trade yet. Uh, a gap fill trade is not going to be until you get inside the gap. Then you you know take a trade right there. But we can kind of come to the conclusion that maybe eventually this gap will fill and the price will start making its way back up towards the gap because other people are also seeing that gap. So eBay here looking pretty good. In terms of moving averages, though, I noticed there's a lot of clusters of moving averages on the one day chart. One day chart moving averages are arguably probably the most accurate and they work the best. They were good for support and resistance and they overall just follow the trend good. There's a big, big cluster here. So you can see we got a purple the 84 EMA. I actually have the 84 specifically for the 15 minute because it shows what the 21 EMA on the one hour time frame is. So the 1584 equates to one hour 21. And that's why I have it on the chart. It's probably pretty close to the 100 EMA as well. So you can kind of look at it as like a 100 EMA. It's not the exact, but and then you see the light blue. We have the one day 50 EMA. And then the dark blue is the 200 EMA which is your long-term moving average, your 200. So you do have to be careful with this cluster coming up. You can even see the yellow here, which is the one day 21. I feel like you know it's gonna have some turbulence right there. Once it starts getting into this cluster, it can reject. So you do have to be careful. And if you really wanted to, you could wait for it to get over the moving averages. And in order to do that, it would have to clear your dark blue dots, which is your 200. It would need to make support off the 200 or just break out of it. And then you can start entering that gap. So if you wanted to wait for it to get over the clusters here, you could do that because there's you know quite a few moving averages here and that could act as resistance. So you have to be careful with that. You can see uh, the 21 and, and uh, 9 EMA over here and the 50 and the 89 all acting as resistance over here. Uh, and then once it got over right here, you got a nice up thrust. You have it trying to bounce here as support falls back under and you can just see the velocity once it starts getting back over the clusters or over your 9 and 21 at least that's when momentum will start picking up you see it especially right here and then you have your 9 which is your green line here it's your 9 EMA you can see it acting as support 
of thrust higher. So I just want to show you the moving averages are right here. You do want to be really careful with that, especially when you're in clusters like that, because that means people are watching multiple moving averages. And if they're all in the same spot, that makes confluence points and that can you know, result in a rejection. Or if you can clear over it, it can make good support as well. So eBay here, I'm going to be looking at calls. Just kind of staying careful with it though, with this cluster coming up. Obviously, I can see it maybe up to the 200 EMA at least before seeing resistance, but it just depends because you do have all these moving averages here, like I said. But if you do want to wait for it to get over, that could be a better point as well. You could maybe even wait for it to start getting inside the gap before taking a trade, but I just want to show you that. So eBay here looks pretty good, it looks pretty bullish as long as it's holding over the trend line here and over demand zone. If you, you know, went with further out calls you know, at least 30 to 60 days expiration. You do have a lot of cushion here with the trend line and also demand as well. But like I said, just be careful of the moving average cluster. And if you really want to be safe, just wait for it to get over. So eBay here, I'm looking at calls. Oh, and also want to throw in here, we do have this slow stochastic crossing up as well. You can see it curl back up, kind of have to zoom in to see it. But once your purple line gets over the orange, that means it's starting to cross back up. Once the purple goes below the orange, it means it's crossing down, as you can see right here. All right, next we're going into Apple. So this is going to be some higher time frame analysis. This is going to be on the one week. Usually on charts, I'm looking at one day or one week time frames. They work the best. You find the best levels. Wall Street is trading these levels. They're not looking at, you know, they're not really looking at intraday levels. They're not looking at, you know, 15 minute and all that they leave that up for you know algorithms to, and stuff to you know, market make and fill fill people's orders but the longer term investors and the large money investors are looking at these one week time frames one month time frame anything high because you can zoom out you can see the perspective better and you're not looking at it on an intraday basis you're looking at it on a couple year basis, maybe even further than that. So Apple here, you can see we do have multiple previous resistances from 2022. So you got a big one right here at 182.94. It actually breached that. You have another one from March 2022 at 179.61. And then you have this last and final one, which is kind of the line in the sand. It's the must hold level because if it gets under that, it can get scary because you really don't have anything here. You have a one day gap that I could show you. But we're at this last one here with the arrow and that's going to be a 176.15. And it doesn't have to hit it exactly before trying to bounce. It's just the general area that you want to pay attention to because if you wait for exact levels to hit all the time, sometimes you're going to miss out. Uh, sometimes you know it's not going to hit directly so you kind of just want to pay attention to the general area unless you're setting specific price alerts like a like at a gap you do want to be sure that it gets inside the gap first but with stuff like this where you're just looking for a general area bounce or a general area support just kind of use the general area you don't have to wait for it to get to 176.15 especially if you're on a higher time frame you're likely going with you know 30 to 60 days of expiration for swing trades and if you're going to day trade these kind of levels, you know, maybe you do want to wait for it to get to the exact point because any drawdown on specific contracts that are short term, that's going to, you know, that can result in a pretty big loss and you might have to stop out sooner than you wanted to. So this 176.15 is kind of the last level. Like I said, this can act as a back test level. I showed you in previous videos, just classic break and retest strategies. It just breaks out. It pulls back into a level. And then previous resistance can act as support. So if you're newer, that's what a breakout and back test is. And usually with breakout and back tests, you do want to wait for like some kind of candle to react to it. So you know that bulls are showing up and buying there. Uh, and you might have to zoom down to the one day for that. If you're trying to look at a one week time frame, you might want to go to the one day time frame for an entry. So you want to see like a one day bar or some type of bullish one day bar reacting to the level we just looked at and showing that it reacts positively. There was bids. Wall Street showed up to buy more and they feel like it's going to go back up. And you're going to see that through one day bars. Usually uh, right now, we don't really have the most bullish one day bar. Friday's close is, you know, not horrible, but at the same time, it's not really bullish either. Right. I mean, look at it. It's just a, just a regular, you know, it's got a bottom wick. It's got a top wick as well. There's no full body showing that, you know, it was just up for a whole straight session. So you might want to wait for a little bit more confirmation on this one, but the 176.15, as long as you're over that, 
I feel like there's still a chance that this can bounce back up. And I showed you the other ones, the 179.61, the 182.94. Those both came from 2022. So you want to get over that one and you want to get back over this one as well to kind of reclaim over the resistances. It went back under. And you also have a big just earnings gap right here. I wouldn't say it's huge, but it's it's pretty decent. So maybe this could fill eventually. I don't think it's going to get up there super quick or anything. I mean, we got September coming up. September gets really weak. So if anything, you'd probably be looking for like a short term bounce on this. If you're a day trader, for sure. And then if you're a swing trader, obviously, definitely I would buy time on it. I personally wouldn't swing calls through September. It can get a little choppy like I showed you here, September all the way into early October. It gets a little eh. So you want to be careful with that. I don't really see a reason here historically to start swinging calls, um, on, especially on big, you know, big cap names that are going to follow the S&P 500 really accurately. And since it makes up the S&P, you know, Apple can likely pull back in September and October as well. So you want to be careful with that. Maybe stick to short term moves on this. I know I'm showing you the one week time frames, and that's usually for higher time frame traders and people who are trying to, you know, swing trade and hold stuff longer. But you know, you can still day trade off of them too. You just want to be, you know, a little more careful and you might have to be a little bit more patient as well. So obviously first price target, if Apple can bounce here on Monday or any, you know, any time next week, 179.61, it's going to be pretty close. Uh, I mean, if you're day trading that, that's, that'll pay fine. It's not going to, you don't really have to get too greedy. Uh, $2 is pretty good if you're day trading. Then obviously if you can get over 179.61, you got 182.94 next. And that's both of these, all three of these actually. So this is a 2022 level. This is a 2022 level. This is also a 2022 level, but they're major peaks. So I would definitely pay attention to them. So that's for Apple here. I'm going to be looking at calls, just not going to be swing trading, you know, into September. So I'm definitely not going to be swinging calls on this. Most likely you're just looking at day trades. But if you do decide to go against the grain and you feel confident despite the despite the historic data, you know, just go 30 to 60 days out. Keep your stop losses under 176.15. And I showed you why. It's because this is your last level. Because if it falls under this, it can get a little bit scary. And you start getting down into that daily gap that you see right there. And that comes from all the way over here. So this level definitely needs to hold. Just be careful. Looks like they just had their dividend X date. Maybe people will want to run into it. Obviously, you need to get in before the X date to get the dividend. But if people see that they're paying out, sometimes that, you know, that can result in people trying to get in for the next one. So we'll see how that goes. All right. Next, we're going into JetBlue's. This is JetBlue Airways. You can see we're pulling into a huge 6120 support. This is all the way from 2022. This goes all the way back to October and also just the end of 2022 in December. So this is a pretty big support after rejecting a huge resistance here, which also came from 2022 and also early 2023. It rejected here. Huge rejection. A lot of the airlines ran up really good, especially DAL, AAL, LUV, all of them. They did pretty good. Those are your you know, big name airlines. But after their most recent earnings, they did have a little correction. And it looks like JBlue kind of got the shit end of the stick the most. Uh, it's definitely not holding structures the same as some of the big airlines, but it's coming to these lows. And you know I love discounts. So I'm looking at calls on this, uh, especially for potential day trade around these areas. As long as the cash open looks fine and it looks like you know, it's reacting to the general area good and it's not you know selling too hard, I'd be fun to buy the dip down here and give it a shot and this could even make a pretty good swing trade if you go further out like i said you need to be cautious in september but this is also not you know gonna follow the s p correlation not as accurate as apple would so you wouldn't really have to i wouldn't say you have to be too worried about the you know historic pullback in september as it relates to the s p because the airlines are kind of a sector of their own and i don't think the correlation with s p is really you know that close but like i said it just depends we've seen like the cruise lines and you know the airlines they kind of have a mind of its own and it really just depends on how travel is doing and that can do good despite you know other sectors doing bad so this one you might be a little bit more safe to follow and hold through september despite the s p pullback that could happen but you know it just depends i would just you know weigh out your risk and definitely keep a stop loss under 621 it's going to be this area right here and you can see exactly why i mean this is your pretty much 
attempt of a double bottom. If it was wanting to make an actual bottom pattern, it would need to get over 935. Once it clears over the resistance and closes with a one week bar, you know, obviously that could take it higher, but it was never, never able to do that. So that's why you couldn't claim that this was the bottom yet. Has to get over the resistance first. So you are kind of going counter trend here. You know, you're buying at the lows, but that does give you better risk to reward. And you just keep your stop loss, you know, relatively tight. It's going to be under 621. It's going to be about 30 cents. If you're trading calls, you know, with options, you definitely, you might have to go besides the chart and just go off of the option premium and go off percentage, you know, 20 to 30% is usually pretty good. That's where I like to keep my stop losses. Sometimes I'll go a little bit higher. It just depends. Uh, and sometimes I'll even... I'll even hold zero if uh, I went pretty small. It just depends. You know, sometimes you just got to give stuff room and then sometimes your expiration just doesn't pan out. Just all about weighing out your risk and how big you went. But you may need to use, you know, option premium to set stop losses and price targets and not charts. So JBlue here looking at calls. Just be careful under 621. Obviously, this level could hold. It looks pretty good. We go to the one day. Looking very, very oversold. You got your slow stochastic starting to cross back up. So that's good. Uh, cross down in this little area here after earnings, but now it's starting to cross back up. So it could be giving a hint into a short term reversal to the upside. Price targets, it would need to get over 660s. And then this is all Sally and balance. So there's really no crazy resistance or anything until this area. So you can see this is previous support. It bounced here, it bounced here, and then once it broke, that's where things got violent. So this is arguably probably the biggest resistance. And then you also have a gap right here. You can consider this gap resistance at about 730s. So I feel like it could retrace all the way back up there because there's really nothing holding it here. You'd probably have to honestly go down to the shorter term time frames to even get any crazy resistances. And that's probably going to be like, you know, 660s. So like I said, 660, if I can get over that, pretty good shot upward. So JBlue here, looking at calls, risk off under 621. All right, next we're going into PayPal. So this is actually probably going to be a more further out swing trade. This is definitely looking on just a tad bit oversold. I would probably buy 30 to 60 days of expiration if you're going to swing this. But it's pulling into this big drop based rally demand zone. It actually was able to finally rally off the bottom after... Looks like they're May earnings. And this is that same imbalance area from the previous bounce. So I'm, I'm hoping, you know, it'll pull at least into the zone, you know, $60 maximum before trying to bounce again. Uh, it honestly just depends. This one week bar doesn't look great. So it may, like I said, it may dip just a little bit further into it before trying to bounce. And if you're going off the one week time frame and you want to swing trade, it might be wise to wait for a one week bar to react off the zone close a little bit higher and then you know they can definitely bounce but if you're just day trading which i'm kind of just looking for a day trade on this but i'm taking into account these lar larger time frame levels because the market can get, can get big imbalances to the upside off these one week demand zones the correlation with paypal and the s p might you know might not be the most accurate so your guess is as good as mine if it's going to follow, you know, the September pullback. Likely PayPal is probably just going to follow the NASDAQ or somewhat similar to it. But I mean, like I said, I mean, NASDAQ's been, you know, running up like crazy and already getting up to, you know, close to its all time highs and PayPal is still down here at the lows. So PayPal and SQ and other financial services can kind of have a mind of their own and they don't have to follow the S&P and the NASDAQ per se. So I was kind of just comparing Apple and saying I would not want to swing calls through September because Apple is going to move just like the S&P 500. And if the S&P 500 historical data is showing that September is going to pull back, uh, or at least it's likely that it's going to pull back, I'd rather not swing calls through that. PayPal here, more at lows. Uh, risk to reward is better. I would feel a little bit more comfortable, you know, holding from down here through August or September as long as this demand zone is holding. But I mean, if it goes under the demand zone, it's going to be 58.95. If it goes under that, obviously that's your risk off. It can get pretty violent because uh, it's kind of like the last thing holding it up. So it still has yet to test this zone just a little bit further down. Maybe it'll probably try to dip into it. And that's when you can look to try to scoop it up and go counter trend. But I mean, if Monday, if it you know, seems like it's holding up and it looks look strong. NASDAQ's holding up strong and everything looks fine. This can definitely balance just a tad shy of the demand zone. You know, we'll just have to see how that goes on Monday or Tuesday. If you go to the one day chart, you can see, I mean, it closed very weak. This 
candle took out the lows of Thursday. It also took out the lows of Wednesday. And overall, it just closed with a lower low of this sequence right here. So it looks like it's going to definitely pull back into this just a little bit. And that's when you can look to, you know, come in and scoop it up. You can see the slow stochastic on the one day is also negative still. So you don't have a positive cross. If you want to wait for that cross, that's smart. Honestly, not a bad idea. So it could be wise to wait for it to cross back up. If you want to wait for a hint of momentum coming back, your slow stochastic crossing back up is going to give you that hint. So PayPal here, we're going to be looking at calls, especially I'm hoping for a further out swing trade just because it's a, it's looking pretty oversold. It doesn't have to be super further out, but I'm going to buy the contracts further out, but I'd be willing to hold it for a week or two. We'll just have to see. And then I'm also willing to you know take day trades on this once it gets inside the zone or gives me some kind of 15 minute confirmation. So PayPal here, looking at calls. All right, now we're gonna go ahead and get into the indexes. This is the SPX or the SPY, S&P 500. It's also what we looked at in the season X chart. And this actually kind of is aligning with a small up thrust that I showed you. It looks like from the 14th up till you know, roughly the 18th or so. So this week could have a short term up thrust. We'll just have to see. But you can see we're holding the back test levels. Last week, I was actually looking for a pullback into 4450. Um, we did exactly that. So we hit my price target. I was looking for this gap to fill also. Uh, pretty much just looking for a little bit more of a pullback into the one week demand we covered last week. And that was this zone right here. So this base candle right here, it's a rally base rally demand zone. And your zone started at 4450. So that's what I was looking for. We got that. And that was as low as I could put it because of the demand zone. And I mentioned we would have to get under the demand zone to even go any lower. But now you can see we're also pulling into these previous back test levels. So we have previous resistance from June 23 and also looks like mid June 23 as well. So these two points could be a great back test trade. It looks like that's pretty much setting up just for a short term bounce at least. Uh, Friday we closed over them and we also held them pretty strong if we go to the 15 minute your demand zone, your back test levels and everything all resulted in a pretty strong hold. I mean, this is choppy, but it held. And look, your first initial reaction was great. Uh, just totally ripped to the upside, right off demand, right off the back test levels and everything. And then you can see we closed over them as well. I think the futures are up just a tad, nothing crazy. I think they're up like 0.2% or something. I wouldn't say that, you know, it closed super weak on Friday. It's only down, you know, a tenth of a percent, nothing crazy. So I'm not looking for your typical red Friday, red Monday, which is a common pattern. I would need to see a little bit weaker for me to expect it to go lower, but anything could happen. As long as these back test levels are holding and this demand is holding, I feel like we're going to see that short term bounce. And that also aligns with the seasonality for this week. So we'll just look as far as this week and then, you know, kind of take next week, depending on the Friday close. So looking for just a short term bounce on SPX this week or SPY, as long as the back test levels are holding. And I think, it, you know, it looks pretty good setting up. One thing I don't like, slow stochastic is crossed down. So maybe if you're a skeptic, you'd want to wait for that to cross back up, which is reasonable. But like I said, you got your back test levels holding still. As long as we open above these on Monday, there's a good chance, you know, we can bounce, especially into Tuesday. All right, next, we're going into the QQQ. So last week, we were focused on it taking out the previous one week lows. We were also focused on SPX taking out the previous one week lows. And I mentioned that, you know, the fact that both of them did that, that it could, you know, send everything just a little bit lower. I wasn't expecting too big of a move down. QQQ got the shit end of the stick the most. It pulled back the most. And it also broke its back test levels. You had a back test level here, similar to the SPY. And one right there, this general 372s was the must hold area. You can see once it got below that, big flushes. And now we're kind of pulling into the 363s and just the lower 360s, which is kind of aligns with this demand zone. So drop base rally demand zone. This is also just a general area of support that it's bounced from previously. So I just want to show you once it got under the back test levels, you know, look at the, how the selling picked up. It's pretty crazy. So that's why SPX, like I just showed you, it's holding those back test levels. It has to remain above them. Otherwise, it can, you know, start looking like this and breaking down. So as long as SPX, you know, is holding over that, it'll look fine. And when QQQ was holding it right here, it also looked fine. It looked like it could bounce. But then once we, you know, started getting under it, that's when the selling started to pick up. So this week, I'm probably just expecting the same thing as the S&P, just a little short term bounce. 
you can see it's really close to 363.40s, which is this support. So this general area is somewhat held. I mean, it's nothing crazy. This is not the most bullish bar. So it might, you know, we might want to wait till Tuesday to see, you know, if we can get the regular Tuesday reversal just because, I mean, it closed weaker than SPY on Friday. So we could see that red Friday, red Monday for the QQQ and then just see chop for the SPX. But it just depends. You know, I don't have a crystal ball or anything. I'm just kind of going off patterns and uh, previous experiences. So as long as it's 363.41 is holding, I feel like, you know, it could bounce this week similar to the SPY and hopefully just follow the seasonality. Uh, my favorite spot for this to bounce would probably be the demand zone I'm show showing you right here. This is a great base candle. This is a big sell imbalance that led to a big buy imbalance. So this area is probably the biggest focus for me. I would like to see it get down there eventually. And I would, you know, be willing to scoop it up, you know, for a, just a quick dead cap bounce or some type of reversal play off of demand. Like I said, you know, you do have the support 363 is just, just shy of the demand zone. So this whole 363 down to 357 is a potential area of support. Uh, I wouldn't want to short right here personally. I'd probably want to wait till September or at least, you know, towards the end of August. Uh, to start looking at puts again or you know if we start breaking under this demand zone and under the demand zone i showed you on spx i'd be willing to as well i feel like regardless of where we're at i'm still going to pick up a hedge towards the end of august i'll probably just buy some spy puts or qqq puts or something uh, just to have a little bit of exposure just in case the you know the historic data is correct and we do that september correction that i showed you in the season x chart so we'll have to see but QQQ here, it doesn't look horrible. It doesn't look great either. I would say the SPX looks better. It held the back test levels as uh, QQQ did not hold the back test levels over here that I'm circling. Uh, so now we're going to be looking for support down at 363.40s, like I said, or this demand zone. So it might need to go a little bit lower first uh, to start getting in at those levels. You can see the slow stochastic also cross negative. So it's nothing great here. Uh, at least SPX had the back test level holding. QQQ broke the back test level and has the slow, sto slow stochastic negative. So just want to be careful of that. Maybe wait for it to get down to these levels to buy or to look for upside. All right, next we're going into the IWM. So these past couple of weeks have been really iffy for the IWM just because we have that supply zone I've been covering it's all the way from early 23. This is that rally based drop supply zone. It's been rejecting off that. But then we also had a rally rally based rally demand zone, which is this base candle right here. It bounced off of that a few times and it tried to hold it up pretty well. Now we're kind of starting to get into the lower end of the demand zone, but it's still holding the drum roll area. You also have a 189.24 back test level. So this is previous resistance from June. It can hold it as a back test level. So Ideally, I kind of expect the same thing, similar to the SPX, just because it's holding the back test level. We could see a bounce here. Uh, and then as well, we're holding the demand still. The one thing I don't like is this slow stochastic here. It's still negative. There's no indication of a crossover yet. It's actually a pretty clean down move in terms of that. But it is starting to get into you know the lower 20 area, which is kind of like an RSI, right? Once it starts getting into the 30 area on RSI, people start looking you know for bounces or they start expecting it to get a little bit oversold. This is similar. Once the slow stochastic starts getting in the 80s, it's a good time to you know be careful as well as it's a good time to start being careful once it gets into the 20s because it could be getting oversold. So that's all I meant by that. But we're holding up the back test level 189.24. It didn't tap it directly. So like, like I was saying earlier, you know, just look for the general area to hold up because your level is not always going to hit to the penny. You know, you just got to be careful with that. You might miss out. So, but it's holding up pretty good. I feel like this could see a short term bounce as well, along with the SPX. As long as your back test levels are holding, if it starts to get under that 189.24, that's where it starts to get just a little bit scary because you have all buy imbalance right here and then no demand until you start getting down to the lower 180s. So IWM here looking for a bounce as long as we're holding over the 189s. All right, next we're going into the VIX. So VIX actually broke back under our 1553. It's the level we've been covering for a few weeks. I mentioned that it needed to stay over that and also get over 17 in order to go higher. It failed to do that. You can see 17 is a huge struggle. You have Monday here, hard rejection. It actually spiked back up, got all the way up to 18 almost, but still closed uh, just a little bit under 16. 
So it's been reacting to this 17 like it's a big, big resistance. So that's why I mentioned that it needed to get over the 17 and close over the 17 in order to keep going higher. It was not able to do that. And then you can see a really desperate attempt here at 1553. We have multiple bounces and closes right at the 1553 level. But then once we had a Friday market, you know, pretty much just crushed the VIX as it usually does. It loves to do it on Fridays like we do to options and other factors. But it's back under the 1553 now. So now I kind of and expecting the market to have a little short-term relief especially that it's back under 1553 and it closed back under it none of these bars right here last week even though it sold off it never closed under the 1553 this week we're going into 17s rejections and we're going into a close under 1553 so that makes me feel a little bit better about the market bouncing up just short term at least i'm not expecting too much i'm not really looking any further than this week just because i have no idea how to forecast i don't have a crystal ball or anything like that so i kind of just take it one day one level one week at a time and right now we're closing under 1553 which means volatility is getting back to lower levels you can see we have the 2021 low at 1473 right here another 2021 low at 1410 right here so these are really low vix levels these are you know years old so and it went even lower than that at one point down to 1273 so if it starts getting under these 2021 lows we could just see it go right back to 1273 although i don't think that's likely with september coming up uh, which usually has a correction that could send the vix spiking back up higher but i need to see it get back over 1553 again and closing over that and i would change my mind and you know that could have you looking crazy for a little bit because it's just chopping and it closed over 1553 a couple times but then once you look at the 17 wick right here you understand why it didn't go higher so your close over 17 was your next piece of evidence to start looking for that market pullback or at least a you know a sound one like a you know one that looks like it's definitely going to happen uh, wasn't able to do that so market's been pretty resilient and volatility is going back lower again so you kind of have to make the assumption that the market could bounce this week it's closing under 1553 uh, it's back under 15 flat so 15 is definitely a psychological level it has been for a couple months now so yep looks like vix is going to go just a little bit lower here but you know mark these 1473 and 1410 those are two 2021 lows and look for them to break under those on the shorter time frames it starts getting under that that's a good signal that the market can go higher all right and next we're going into the dxy so this is the us dollar we we're looking for it to get over this trend line before assuming anything and it finally broke out of that so i can really expect this to go a little bit higher as long as it gets on over 103s so when it broke out my price target was going to be the 2020 covid peak which is always kind of been my go-to level here in terms of using it as a level to get over or get back under that's kind of the extreme level so if it gets over 103s obviously that can take you to 103.50s which is this little peak right here and then above that you know back to upper 104s so i really can't see past 103 right now because we're still under it but if we can get over that and close over it i can definitely see the you know dollar going higher and that could scare the markets but markets haven't really been reacting too much to the dollar. I mean, obviously we had a little pullback last week is nothing huge. Volatility still closed down 6%. Uh, DXY has been doing its own thing. I mean, it's it's been bouncing since mid-July. So, And even with this bounce and reclaim back over the 100s, market's still been doing fine. And we haven't really had a huge correction or anything. Just, you know, there's that little pullback that we were expecting into 4450 on the S&P that we went over last week. So the correlation with the dollar and the markets have been really goofy lately. And it's good to see the VIX and the dollar move together to kind of get a really good volatility signal. Because that's what I'm using the dollar for. I'm using it for, you know, volatility signals. Because when the currencies get volatile, that's when equities can get volatile as well. So now we're breaking out and, you know, that's just a little bit scary especially if you're a trader in 2022 i mean we were reacting to every single dollar move possible if the dollar was up the markets were down if the dollar was down the markets were up that's, that's just how it was for like a year straight so we're kind of just getting out of that and the correlation along with everything else is kind of switched up a little bit um bonds we're also selling off with stocks which is really strange because bonds you know used to be a good hedge when the market would go down bonds would go up and that's why the 64 
the 6040 portfolio exists, which had the worst year it, it has had in a really long time. The 6040 portfolio did horrible in 2022, which just goes to show you the correlation with some of this stuff. It's just been really wacky. It's pretty crazy though, seeing the dollar get back over 182 after this really steep sell off. And then it's just been going nonstop since. And now we're breaking out of this trend line. It makes you wonder if we start shooting over 103, is that going to bring the market back down? And maybe the market won't be as resilient because once it gets over that 2020 COVID peak, the market tries to go to extremes. So when it got over 103 here, dollar shot up really heavy. It tried to get over 103 here and you can see the volatility picked up a little bit and then ended up failing at 103.50s. So if it starts getting over 103 and closing over that, you know, you might have to be careful with the market and that could spook people to start selling equities. So just keep that 103 level in focus. You can see the slow stochastic uh, starting to get kind of up into overbought levels, but it's still positive, right? The crossover is still up. It's just, you know, in the upper 80s. So once it got up into the 90s here, back in May, the dollar did eventually sell off. And you can see that here. I could even draw a line right here. So this is where it topped out right here, up here. It was in the upper 90s. And that's when the dollar sold back off. So dollar's kind of getting back up to that level. So that's why I need to see it getting over 103 first. Uh, you know, before assuming it can go higher. But you do have the breakout here, which is good. If you want to see the dollar go higher. And right now, it looks like it's actually starting to work its way up. Almost at 103 now. So it's shooting up a little bit tonight, which is a little bit concerning. Especially if you want to see the market go up. But you know, market's resilient, it can shrug off currencies, we'll just have to see. But right now the dollar is showing us a breakout and we're coming up to a major 2020 level, which is the COVID peak from the last DXY spike. So that's the video guys, hope you guys enjoy. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe to our Xtrades YouTube channel. I'm gonna get this chopped up, edited, and sent out. I love you guys, and I'm out.